in pole position then in terms of rounding off this particular session, and indeed rounding off the presentations for the whole conference, is Jim Hahi. Jim is the uh, chairman of the Ulster Angling Federation. Jim has extensive experience in terms of representing anglers' views in all sorts of different fora, and I'm sure he'll have some interesting comments to make from an angling perspective in terms of what he's heard uh, so far in terms of our discussions and our debates. Jim. Thank you. Can you hear me, Houston? Um, the Ultra Angling Federation is a small amateur organization um, representing other small amateur organizations. Uh, we do what we can, but most of the operation is fairly low key uh, and low input. Um, what I'm about to say will be mercifully short, hopefully. Uh, I don't think I'll be saying anything you haven't already heard over the last couple of days. Hopefully, it'll give you a little food for thought. Is stalking the answer to the problem? Uh, my comments that you're going to hear apply to my amateur knowledge of the Northern Ireland fisheries. I don't claim any expertise like some of the other speakers here, um, only what we've learned down through the years. And the question of stocking, um, uh, we think it does fairly well because we've been doing it for so long. <laughs> this is uh, from a, a 1972 fishery board report. And you can see there 600 trout, 37 salmon lifted to be taken to a hatchery. Uh, my understanding, speaking to the club, was that those were adult trout. I'd like to see the reaction now if somebody came to lift 600 trout from the river. Um, and also, uh, during these early years, there were an awful lot of uh, bush eggs placed out in various places at various times with probably not a very uh, structured approach to it. There were largely reactions to fish kills and things like that. So over the years, there's been uh, quite a bit of stocking out. The likelihood is that they had uh, very little effect. Certainly, there was uh, not much done to track any potential effect. If we take a broad brush look at all the factors that you've heard over the last couple of days that affect salmon, um, uh, well, that this affects their abundance and the degree of difficulty that's involved in doing anything about them. If you look at the top of that chart, you'll see things like sea temperature changes, climate change, which we're not going to affect in the next year or two. Down at the, the middle area, there are some uh, uh, abundance factors that we can influence with really quite a bit of difficult uh, effort, water quality and water quantity is difficult to address in Northern Ireland um, where the rural area is really largely um, farming dominated and farming needs tend to take the lion's share of consideration. At the bottom you'll see a, a reference to salmon stock enhancement being straightforward. That's straightforward in the sense that it's straightforward to build a hatchery but of course not necessarily straightforward to, to achieve any success with it. What is stalking? We've heard quite a bit about stalking over the last couple of days. I confess to some little confusion in that we've heard uh, about stalking at different times, different places. You can stalk eyed over, unfed fry, fed fry, par, smolts. You can use wild parents, imported parents, specific, specific ranch strains. If you take just those two groups, there's 15 different types of stalking there. And uh, if you vary some of those, there's almost an infinite number of variables on what we actually mean by stalking. And over the years, I think it's become uh, fairly well established that for, for, for instance, in our rivers in Northern Ireland, we're not going to achieve success by breeding a whole lot of power and smokes and throwing them into the river. It's not going to happen. However, we think there is a possibility that that tool should not necessarily be thrown out of the toolbox and that there are some instances in which it can make a contribution. And one example is a small river in Northern Ireland, which I, I try not to name because I'd rather concentrate on the principle than the detail of that specific river. And this river has had a hatchery program for quite a number of years now, um, roughly 30 years. And when they started off, they wanted to uh, promote sea trout. The 
uh, at that time, the uh, civil unrest in Northern Ireland was, was widespread. Poaching was rife. The local fishery board in one year counted five reds on this river. It's a small river, small coastal spit river, about 12 miles long. They counted five reds on the river and denied there was any poaching. Uh, a club was set up and developed over the next few years, and within uh, 18 months, they had succeeded in 15 convictions for poaching. And later on, some of the, the poachers who were convicted included a parish priest and an army sergeant. <laughs> so you can see what the situation was. They had uh, some sea trout, and they wanted to build a hatchery for sea trout. They went to see the people at the bush, and the bush people said, can't do it, we tried it, forget it. So they went back to their home and said, well, we'll give it a go anyway. They gave it a go, cut a long story short, over the years, trial and error, quite some trials and quite some errors, but they gradually uh, have built it up and they have a functioning hatchery there at present. And I was most interested to hear the reference from, I think it was David Solomon, about the decoy effect. Because when this club started to hatch sea trout, lo and behold, salmon, which were almost unknown, started to trickle into the river uh, to the point where uh, the, the hatchery is now largely devoted to salmon rather than sea trout. They raise uh, to unfed fry level. They lift about 70 fish a year on a half and half male and female ratio, produce around maybe 200,000 unfed fry. They uh, look at the river and see what areas are not being spawned naturally, and they take various things into account. This river is what has been referred to by the local drainage authorities as a dynamic juvenile river. It's very mobile, huge amounts of gravel get shifted. Um, some years ago, one of the drainage engineers had to do a job in the river, and there was an enormous pile of gravel sitting in the river bank, and he said there were 50,000 tons of gravel in that pile, and the farmers were invited to come and help themselves. Um, so this is a wee bit like some of the articles I read about the Karen. They, they appear to have reached equilibrium. It's a very spitty river. The opportunities for serious angling are really quite limited to uh, a few hours at the end of a spate. Uh, at the minute, there would be round terms catching something like 140 sea trout, 70 salmon. The sea trout can be qu are quite good. These are not finnick. They can be quite good salmon, two to five pounds and a few larger. And this has been a, a, a long-term uh, exercise on the part of the club. But the important thing to say is that it hasn't been a, an isolated alternative. It hasn't, they, they didn't ignore everything else. It was part of a, a program of works on the river. The, the club have looked at many things on the river. Poaching has been a main one, but also uh, looking at habitat and uh, where r the river has needed some work. So habitat has been, habitat improvement has been done. And it is, the, the hatchery has been part of a general uh, effort to improve the health of the river. <coughs> the the broodstock are lifted each year. Broodstock are not held from one year to the next. They uh, are brought into the hatchery, uh, stripped. The eggs are raised to the unfed stage. They uh, identify areas as, as have a, which have inadequate natural spawning and cover those with the output from the hatchery and the uh, fish are then released. And the, the objective here is to complement natural spawning, uh, mitigation I think was the word used earlier, uh, to mitigate against some of the damage to the river, maybe shortfalls, um, a lack of uh, a spread of fish in the river in, in relation to the spawning areas. This means that it's a very low cost, it's an angling club voluntary labour, some capital cost, uh, originally, of course, for a building and now and again for treatment chemicals, uh, a few things, not much trays. It's low input, there's no feeding, there's minimal broodstock holding. The fish are usually in and out within six weeks to two months, yeah, the broodstock. And one of the uh, things that has happened recently, they've had uh, at least two absolutely enormous floods with uh, enormous um, amounts of gravel getting washed down the river. And the club feel that the, this type of approach gives them the opportunity to mitigate, at least to some extent, 
for uh, loss of, of eggs that have been spawned in that manner. We've heard all about the problems from hatcheries. Um, some anglers definitely do see it as the, the answer to their prayers. Uh, we all know it isn't. Um, the problem, as uh, was mentioned on the spay, can we improve on nature? That if we take broodstock and take them away and put them somewhere else, are we improving on, on nature? Um, there's arguments on both sides there. The, the club feel that in covering areas which are not naturally spawned, they at least have a, a, a good chance of doing so. In, in river genetic variation, there's been a lot of talk about that. This is a very small river. It's nothing like the scale of the, the Lake of the Spey or the, the uh, Wye or any of these rivers. Very small spate river. And the club feel that the, the genetic variation, the potential for genetic variation within that isn't great. The benefits of the hatchery have been seen uh, as being colossal, really. The interest, the ownership, the education of the anglers, it, uh, it all helps to uh, uh, generate a, a view whereby the, the, the objective is the, the protection of the river. I remember when there was a hatchery in the River, river Falkland many years ago, the man who ran it, who used to run uh, down to the river and kill hundreds of fish every year, said he can't bring himself to kill a fish anymore. And that sort of feeling tends to, to run through a club, not everybody, of course. It incentivizes bailiffing, fish conservation, um, more people uh, are likely to indulge in catch and release or at least limit their catches. It raises the, the awareness of the importance of general catchment health. It's low key, low input, low-ish risk, low cost, what we call light touch stocking. However, natural spawning has to be the aim. I was very interested to, to hear some of the speakers talk about the importance of power in spawning success. But the difficulty this club faced initially was that in large areas of the river there, there were no power at all. And in areas where there are no power or very few power, what options are available to us then if you have gone through everything else and, and, and nothing appears to be working? And even if you go through these other things, it's a four year uh, return period for salmon. Even if you give it two uh, generations, that's eight years. That's an awful long time to be sitting back and doing nothing when perhaps you could be doing something. For those eight years, you might be relying on wild spawning. In Northern Ireland, uh, we don't have any wild rivers. You may have them in the north of Scotland or Iceland somewhere. We don't have any. All our rivers have been very heavily um, changed by a man, us, drainage and uh, field drainage and bog drainage and so forth and intensive agriculture. So uh, it seems a, a bit questionable to look back at figures from 20, 40 odd years ago and say, ah, but in the old days it was great we had this run and that run. The amount of change in um, land usage in Northern Ireland over that 20 to 40 years has been colossal. And uh, uh, we simply feel that the amount of wild or natural spawning that was happening years ago simply isn't happening now. One other way of observation is the conservation limits. Uh, we have one river, coastal river, where the, the conservation limit is set at something like 52 fish. But that presumably presumes that those 52 fish will be perfectly spread across that river, that you won't have an excess in one pool and another pool might be empty. And we just feel that that's a bit of a weakness of the, the conservation limit analysis. Habitat conservation and improvement uh, has to be the key element. The hatchery can be a, 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 an added factor that, uh, to that, but habitat, habitat, it's all about habitat. I was at a meeting recently where uh, it was said that what we really need in Northern Ireland is whole river restoration, which would be brilliant. We would love to see that. <laughs> but in this day and age, I don't think it's going to happen. The River Tyne has been mentioned. We would like to see the time not untangled. If stocking was the cause of the rehabilitation, magic, off we go. If it wasn't, well then, large scale restocking doesn't appear to be doing too much damage. There's a big question there. Uh, we would like to see it answered. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to see what people would come up with on that. 
You may know the song, Things Can Only Get Better. Sometimes anglers feel that uh, in looking after salmon, we're a bit like Mr. Micawber waiting for something to turn up. John Gibb got fed up waiting for something to turn up on the lochie and went out and did something. You can argue about what he did and how successful it was, but he went out and did something. Um, Looking at the present indicators, it doesn't look like um, things are going to turn up thinking about the the sea situation really rather than in catchment habitat. So therefore what can we do? And uh, I thought, well, let's ask the experts. NASCO. And Peter Hutchinson is over in the corner there and will answer all questions, I'm sure, Peter. In 1999, they produced an action plan for the precautionary approach where stocks are below their conservation limits Uh, Stock rebuilding programs should be brought forward, including, as appropriate, stock enhancement. As appropriate. Fast forward to 2012. Many salmon stocks are below their conservation limits. Stock rebuilding programs should be developed. Uh, And by uh, reference back to the 1999 document, including, as appropriate, stock enhancement. However, in our current NASCO implementation plan up to 2018, there's no mention of stock rebuilding plans, and many of our rivers are below conservation level. And it looks like until 2018, we may have to wait for something to turn up. Um, we have a number of, quite a number of rivers below their conservation limit. Juvenile surveys are really very patchy at best. Um, we don't really like waiting around for something to turn up. We think that the the river that I've described introduces the possibility that the tool of the hatchery shouldn't be thrown out of the toolbox. It's possible that a light touch hatchery could be making a positive contribution to our problems until such times as natural runs hopefully start to increase. and so if, uh, in, in relation to light touch stocking, if we're not going to do it now, when are we going to do it? That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thanks very much, Jim, for win- winning us back some time. So initially what I'm going to do is throw open the last three papers. So we had uh, Roger with Stephen and with Jim, and certainly I'll take any questions. Uh, Jim, uh, John, you were going to ask a question earlier. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Just very briefly, um, thanks very much indeed to the last three speakers. I thought it was extremely interesting. I don't want to make a comment or a question about the appropriateness or not about stocking in the various captions we've heard about. Um, I'm not here to ask that at all. I don't know enough about them. But I found very interesting that uh, Roger's presentation and Jim's presentation both talked about... um, stocking programs which put out approximately 200,000 to 230,000 fry. And um, my question is about cost, because I'm left a bit confused, is one program seems to be costing between 60 and 120,000 pounds a year, but Jim's just told us that they've got a 200,000 stocking program which is very low cost and largely run on voluntary labor. So this is just for people who are maybe thinking about stocking and wondering about how much does it cost to run a hatchery, as we're seeing two very different scenarios here. And largely, I would suggest that um, the Spey hatchery, it's, it's, at some level, it's a choice to run a hatchery for that price. Um, as well as running the Lockheed program, I also run contracts for nine different other rivers. We do a lot of fry programs. And we, we cost out fry at about, this is just to give people an idea, about two to five pence per fed fry. My calculation is the spay hatchery at the moment, their fed fry are costing about 25 to 50 pence per fry. And I would question this, this hatcheries up and down the country that are producing a couple of hundred thousand fry and it's been run on a part-time nature by voluntary people, by stalkers, by keepers, by bailiffs, and it's certainly not costing that sort of money. And I just, it's not to make any comment about whether a hatchery is the right thing or the wrong thing on the spay, but it's just about cost. I just want to, it's not really a question, it's a statement out of my experience. 
Thank you very much, John. Roger, do you want to make a comment on that? Um, oh, there he is. I have one last thing. I, I heard you say earlier. Um, you um, I think the difference may be in uh, the use of employees as opposed to volunteers. When I gave those figures, they were as accurate as I could possibly make them because I was taking into account the employment cost of our factory manager, a proportion of the bailiff's time and thereby their salaries, national insurance, pensions, etc., etc., a proportional cost of the vehicles as opposed to using volunteers. And I suspect that their time as a cost may not be incorporated into some of the costings that have been produced here. I'm talking about a, uh, I, what I believe to be an accurate reflection of the costs of running our hatchery program with employed professionals. My name is Graham Salisbury. Um, I represent um, a group uh, of spay rods and gillies. Um, I'm obviously here representing myself as well as a stakeholder. Um, I've been here for almost two days now listening to the various arguments back and forward. Um, some of them very interesting. Um, I just wanted to put to, obviously, Roger, um, who's in the seat at the moment, I'd just like to ask him what the limiting factors are on the spay at the moment. Um, it's obviously very, very well studied over the years. Um, and certainly the group that I represent um, feel that we have got some limiting factors at the moment um, due to the, the recent returns over the last few years. Well, I'm not a scientist, as I said from the start, but. What I can say is that our scientists, in con working in conjunction with the Spay Foundation Committee, has established the area of, of parts of the catchment where we can realistically stock our fed fry from the hatchery. We didn't create a figure of 230,000 and then work out where we were going to put those fish. It was a case of an Brian analyzing areas of the catchment that we could stock for mitigation purposes, and then through his electrofishing, working out the capacity, and thereby the numbers that we could viably stock into those areas. Yeah, I think the problem from, you know, the group that I represent, who obviously you know quite well, um, Roger, is that the spay is really well studied. It's, it's one of the big four, um, and at the moment, the group I represent don't feel um, that we've identified or we've not heard that you've identified clearly enough what those limiting factors are. Um, is it habitat? Is it the fact we're not producing enough smolts, etc.? And, and that's obviously the first point that's been highlighted you know, throughout this meeting over the last two days. And then secondly, we've obviously got unique facilities on the spay um, with Tulkin, who are a member uh, of Spay Rods and Gillies, who are offering yourself and the Spay Board a free facility to use their hatchery, um, totally funded by them to sort of assist the cause. And I think the group I represent would really like some clean cut answers to those sort of issues. Well, I think if you uh, look on our website, Graham, you'll find that. Uh, our biologist, Brian, has published an extensive uh, electrofishing report cover covering the juvenile surveys that have been conducted throughout the catchment. And that really very clearly highlights the areas within the catchment that are potentially, or could potentially be supported by stocking, rather than just trying to find areas that uh, we're, we're trying to, to, to maximise the numbers that can be planted out. Brian's put a great deal of work in. We presented this at public meetings even in September of this year, at which you were present. I was present, yes. Where we clearly explained, presented the results of all those uh, juvenile surveys 
uh, across the catchment, not just the main stem, but uh, quite a lot of the tributaries as well, and have really quite clearly identified those areas which have the potential for stocking and those really where the natural populations of salmon really dictate that we should not be stocking. How we do, Graham, what you're asking in terms of identifying the problems, because I think that's the first step they're going to talk about in terms of our general discussion. So maybe we might just park this for the moment, given that it's space specific. I think the general points are very well taken, and we might come back to that then and use it as an example in terms of the general discussion, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Okay. This lady had a, had a question very early on there. I'm just keep waiting on the mic here. Yeah. Uh, it, um, hi Roger, it, it kind of leads on from what you, what you were just sort of saying then, but just uh, if you could clarify um, the, these areas for mitigation, how are you defining those on the spay? I, I know you said in your talk that you, you did believe the hatcheries could be an effective tool in the right circumstances. What, what do you define as those right circumstances? Yes? Yeah. Back. Uh, hi again. So you're just saying there that you're stocking above barriers and that you also showed that your stocking maybe isn't producing the same numbers of fish of rods to the fi fish to the rods, sorry, which you would like. Is it possible looking at what the guys did on the Y and actually trying to mitigate the barriers themselves rather than stock above them? It's okay getting the fish down, but can they get back up again from where you've released them or maybe? So you said just then that you're stocking above riverine barriers um, of the juveniles, <clears throat> but you also said that the stocking previously hasn't helped numbers of fish coming back. Um, so maybe if you take in from the Y example by removing the barriers or putting fish passes in, they improved their stocks? Well, what, what I was saying was that I was comparing the numbers of fish that have returned to the rods. Uh, that is something that we have been able to, to monitor through the uh, through the gillies and the anglers. And it's specifically the numbers of fish returning to the rod fishery rather than returning to the river as a whole. Okay. okay. Um, Angus Alfred from the uh, Yorkshire Esker Rivers Trust. It was a, a question of uh, Stephen, actually, and uh, probably a very practical one. Um, and it was uh, to do with, uh, obviously, the removal of uh, barriers uh, you've, uh, I can't remember quite how many, but a very significant number. And uh, I just uh, was interested to understand how you have been able to sort of negotiate their removal because presumably they must have been in sort of individuals' ownerships. Well, the first person to ask is the owner of the barrier. You then get permission from the Environment Agency or the local authority, depending on whether it's Main River or otherwise. You might need permission from the planning officer, who's not always the most helpful person in one of our counties. Um, and then you have to ensure that what you do doesn't cause any adverse flooding, erosion, or anything else. And that might involve a, a sort of technical survey. But believe me, it's all worth it, because you do this one-off thing, and it's gone forever and your river above is full of fish. Ah, well now, I'm gonna ask Pete. <laughs> there was a move to um, put the onus of fish passage on the owner of an obstruction. That somehow got lost in the annals of where, Pete? Um, Westminster, I think. Uh, there is talk of fish passage regulations being introduced next year. Um, which would provide some kind of 
uh, targeted, I suspect, obligation on the owner of a structure to um, provide fish migration, but whether or not that's going to come in, once the regulatory impact assessment is known, uh, I have my strong doubts. Uh, I just support what Stephen says, um, take weirs out. As Kyle knows, I've taken the biggest weir out in England and Wales. Biggest. <laughs> Americans, I don't know. Um, it's, always, it's always the right solution, uh, um, and you should do everything you can to achieve that. Yeah, just apropos of nothing, um, Ken, I meant to point out when I was on the lug and arrow there, and this is for the geneticists, just by the top fish pass we put in is Darwin's house. Um, just so, something in passing. take one more, I'll take Ted's, and then we have to move on to the main discussion. We can yeah, hi, it's uh, Ian Russell Sufas. I'm a little reluctant to stick my head above the parapet on the River Tyne, because I know it's uh, generated some fairly uh, sort of widely divergent opinions uh, over the years, but since Jim mentioned it and raised the question of the Tyne knot, I thought I'd just make a couple of comments. I was involved with Nigel Milner as one of the co-authors of a study that we did some years ago looking at the Tyne. Unfortunately, we didn't have the benefit of uh, genetic uh, investigation or genetic techniques, but we did have um, tagging studies on which we were able to make informed estimates of the contribution of hatchery fish to the tyne rod catch. Um, and sort of my memory on this now was that in the early stages of recovery, it's, this was perhaps up to around 20% or so, but as the tyne recovered, um, the contribution of Kielder to the rod catch was just of the order of 2 or 3%, so really quite small. And, and the main conclusion of the report, as I recall, was that natural processes, natural recovery, water quality improvements were the dominant process in the recovery of the time. So sort of clarification really, I think, on, on, on my understanding of the sort of science behind the time, time story. Thank you, Ian. J just to mention as well, um, Peter Gray, who was to the fore in all of this debate, poor Peter, passed away a few weeks ago. So just to mention him at the meeting, I think is appropriate and to say uh, how much he enriched all of our lives with this sort of debate. He was a great debater and I think we would have welcomed him here today. Um, I think, sorry, John, I think uh, um, uh, Ted was next. Um, yeah. Well, um, Ian, Ian covered one of, one of my points. I had another point, though, um, for Jim. Um, he was talking about the NASCO um, principles and about the uh, stock rebuilding programs. And I just wanted to emphasize that a stock rebuilding program isn't stocking. It's anything you can do to restore the stock. And I think Stephen Mark Smith gave us a, an excellent presentation on uh, the whole range of things that you can do as part of a stock rebuilding program. And if you go to the NASCO website, I think there is even guidelines on stock rebuilding programs. <laughs> John, do you mind if I hold on until, until, until the general discussion? Peter, do you just want to put in a clarification? We really will have to move on then to the main it, discussion. It was, it was just to build on Ted's comment, really, um, that the implementation plans don't specifically mention stock rebuilding programs. They are, if you like, a stock rebuilding plan. And they, they should cover actions dealing with the fisheries, habitat, and aquaculture <laughs> issues. So in effect, an implementation plan is, if you like, a, a stock rebuilding program. Thanks, Peter.